All right, so the answer is yes. Wonderful, thank you. All right, let's move on into, into overview of what we will talk about. So just like I said, hopefully the session will be quite practical, give you some practical tips. And we will start with um, trying to understand why we should include videos in our courses, what to record, what not to record, and also how to record and how not to record. So um, stay tuned for, for, those, for those tips on how and how not to. So as for pedagogy and video, um, several studies that I've read suggest that um, there, there are quite um, extensive pedagogical benefits to including videos in courses, especially the videos of yourself as an instructor or created by yourself as an instructor. And the reasoning for it is that videos provide uh, deeper learning. And I actually have a very, um, I have an example from real life at, uh, at my college, uh, in an automotive program, an instructor was recording uh, his uh, his lectures during the pandemic because there was no other way. And he actually found out that his students are doing better when studying automotive online than in person. Because you know, in person, if there are ten students uh, gathered around one engine, there's only certain angle that you can look at. However, if you're looking at it from front front row seat, then you are able to see everything that you need to see. So his uh, learning outcomes were actually much better than, I think he said the last 14 years that he was teaching. So I think it was an extremely, um, uh, extremely practical uh, home run for, for him, for, for his course. Oh, Jamie went to his, to his uh, CAT session, yes. Um, also, students are able to watch on their own time. So including videos provide certain learner autonomy and responsibility for their own learning. And it also can be motivating and inspiring because you as an instructor can uh, transfer your enthusiasm for the topic through the video probably better than through through text. So that can definitely be something that will inspire your courses. And also providing an additional format of your content is very good for the universal design of your of your course. We will talk about it a little bit later. Um, today, I think it's at the session is at one o'clock. So definitely if you were on the fence whether to record videos or not, whether it's worth it, I'm telling you the research shows that yes, it is worth it. So hopefully by the end of the session you will know how and um, you will start. You will start with your own videos. So, what can be a video? Now, not every single content or not every single piece of information is a good videoable material. So, what is a good videoable material? I'm creating my own words here. Um, something that is visual, right? It's always it's always easier to to give information about visual um, stuff visual content through video rather than ex uh, describing it in text. Also, if you have anything in real life, that particular automotive program that I was telling you about, they were thinking about taking video camera into one of the um, car dealership in the area and just have it in um, um, have, a, have a video of a real time situation, a real life situation that can happen. So uh, that's definitely one of those things that is good on, on video. If you have anything to demonstrate either uh, on a computer or in real life with hands on, just like the instructor was doing that I was telling you about, it's definitely good videoable um, content. And uh, what I also found out uh, is very helpful to students. If you have a, an assignment in your course that is more complex than just write a, write a paper on X, Y, and Z, something that is maybe um, spanning several modules, something that the students prepare outline for, and then maybe they go out in, uh, in, uh, in the world and interview, interview somebody and then come back and do research. So something that has more steps it definitely is uh, more, it can, it can make the assignment clearer when you record it in addition to including text, right? So something that is more complex definitely can benefit from being recorded as a, as a video. And of course, if you have interviews, uh, an interview is definitely more lively if you are able to record them rather than just uh, provide transcription to students. So think about any of those possibilities or opportunities in your course 
where uh, you can turn your content into, into a video or visual content. Now, what not to record? Try not to re record anything that is in the book in the exact same way. The purpose of the video is to provide additional information. So if you already have explanation of, I don't know, um, dolphins habitat in a textbook, there's no need to record exactly the same thing as a video, right? So if you have different angle on a topic, yes, that is absolutely something that, uh, that students would benefit from. If it's the same, same thing, just in different format, uh, maybe try to save your, your recording time for some, other, for some other topic. So try not to duplicate exactly the same thing that students already have in some other way. And when it comes to what is the most engaging, what kind of video is the most engaging? In research, I found that shorter videos are more engaging than longer ones. And we will talk a little bit later about the exact minute um, that the video should last for your students to, uh, to be engaged. Um, also, what is very good for students is you informally talking to students as if you were in a classroom, as if they were in a classroom, right? So it doesn't many times, we, we stress about the highest quality of sound, the highest video quality. I mean, yes, those things are very important. However, what is probably more important is the connection of you with, the, um, with, your, with your students, right? So very informally speaking to your students as if they were in your office and you were, you were doing the uh, office hour talk. I think that is very, there is something that students appreciate and are able to actually watch longer videos of. And also um, con style tablet drawings, it's something that you're hopefully seeing on the, on the screen is basically where um, it's like a bird, uh, bird's eye view of somebody drawing something on, on, uh, on tablets. So that is also, that was also found to be engaging. What was found not to be engaging though, is pre-recording classroom, classroom lectures. And I know many of us are so excited because we have so much recording coming out of a year of pandemic and everything was online and everything was recorded. We just want to reuse those things for future uh, semesters. And I want to warn you against that. Um, number one, it might be too long for a student to stay engaged throughout the whole thing. Number two, it's like um, uh, my, my mom has a saying, and I want you to take it with a grain of salt. It's like licking, licking an ice cream through glass. It's so close yet so far. I could have been in the classroom and could have had fun, but instead I'm just watching the recording of the fun that they had, right? So it's very, it's, it can be less personal if you, if you just, re, then if you just record video talking um, informally to your students. So if you have classroom lectures, maybe a, a suggestion might be to, to cut out little pieces and then just use those little pieces of the content that you, you think was particularly well explained in that lecture. So don't use, try not to use the whole lecture just in, you know, try to make it a little bit shorter if you're if you're able to. And as for the length of the of the videos, research is showing that video for a student to stay engaged with should be less than six minutes. So here is here is the connection between the lectures being recorded as a whole chunk of sixty or ninety minutes and then what the research is showing is engaging to students right so if you have something that you are able to chunk into little pieces I think that is more more efficient than if you had just one whole entire lecture so try to try to cut it in uh, five to six minute pieces and you'll be much better off and actually the instructor I was telling you about that's that's exactly what he found out he said that he only recorded one single concept in the video, and he actually, his videos were even, some of the, his videos were even shorter, about three, three to four minutes. And he found out that some of his students actually um, watched the video 30 times, three zero, 30 times, because it wasn't that big of a time commitment. It was three minute video, and they were trying to figure something out on their own. Over, I mean, just just look at how you are um, how you are watching YouTube videos. If you're trying to learn something, right? You stop, you go back, you stop, you go back. So you watch it several times, and it's hard to do it if you have humongous long lectures. So um, yeah, try to stay between five to six minutes. 
between six and nine minutes, uh, you can get away with. However, research found, I found in research that if the video is nine minutes and up, students don't even click on it. So think about what you are trying to do. I know we have all this information to convey, but also the human nature is such that we are just not that interested in educational videos that are nine minutes and over. And I know entertaining videos, videos on YouTube are an hour long and we are fine sitting through them. However, when it comes to education, there is something that we are just not willing to, to put up with. And those are the videos over, over nine minutes long. And um, I was just going to ask that question, trying to explain mathematical concepts take longer than uh, four to six minutes, right? Well, try to, um, try to see if you're able to, to make shorter subconcepts and then have a, maybe a playlist of, of a certain problem that will con consist of several shorter videos that explain certain steps maybe, or certain uh, subconcepts of, um, of the main concept. So hopefully um, we all remember to record videos shorter than, than six minutes. Now uh, for, the, for the student engagement, what, what works the best, and it goes with a little bit what I, what I was talking about before, informal is better than formal, simple is better than complex, Personal is better than impersonal. Just remember during the, uh, during the last year, we all had to work from home and uh, children came into the picture, cats and dogs came into the picture. And it all created a connection between you as instructor and the student. I actually had a chemistry instructor telling me that my students at, a, at the end of every lecture, they want to see my dog. So, you know, there was a little, little connection between a little human to human connection with that. So try to be as personal as you're able to, of course, not overshare, but, um, but definitely I've been joined multiple times already by my cat. Yeah, there you go. And it just creates that, oh yeah, this is a human on the other, on the other end and I am too. So, you know, there's, there's just automatic something that you have together and try to be humorous if you're able to. Now, uh, if you know yourself, I know myself, I kill every single joke that I try. So I'm just not going to, right? Because that's, I'm not very um, jokey kind of person, but if you are, I think you should use those in, um, um, in, your, in your videos because they go, they go far. Uh, my students love seeing my baby after lecture. There you go. All right. Uh, also, what I found is that video is most most times watched mo the most times when it's connected a, to a to an assignment. If it's just video on its own, that's fine. However, if students have to watch video to complete an assignment, that video will get the most view. So try to. Um, try to connect those things and make maybe make videos a required so-called required portion of your assignment. Or what you can also do to increase um, to increase number of views is have instructions in the video somewhere. You know, just have have um, um, and some additional instructions for for your assignment um, hidden in the videos. What also I've done before, I include codes in the video. So I uh, create video, and uh, somewhere in the middle, I say, "So uh, if you once you are completing your discussion that is connected to this video, just put a code word summer anywhere in the discussion." And that way I will know that you watch the video. So then I go into the discussion and anybody who does not have the code word in it, I will ask, hey, um, I'm seeing that you did not really view the video. Do you mind going back? There is additional information that you might find useful in, um, um, in, uh, in your course. And I'm seeing chats pop in and out and I apologize, I'm not able to, um, to watch them, but I will catch up um, later on. And also suggest, uh, research suggests that it's a good idea to make students work while they watch. What that means, you ask students in the video, now stop the video and do X, Y, and Z. Now, I personally very much don't like it. It, it disrupts my flow and I, I cannot concentrate afterwards. So I don't use it, I don't like it, but generally research say that it is, uh, it is something that students, um, that students prefer. And I would like to see in the chat area if if you personally you like being interrupted in the video and then asked to do something and then come back to the video. 
All right. And um, in addition to, to recording video, don't also forget to record audio only. It's very, again, very good for variability of your materials for, for different, different modalities. So um, sometimes when you just think about some concept that you can really explain good uh, in a certain way, but you don't really feel like getting ready for the camera, getting the lights ready, whatever, just record audio. It's definitely very helpful and it provides the variety that you're looking for or students are looking for in your courses. Now, when you do have um, audio only recordings, don't forget transcript. That is very important for accessibility. And also for, oops, I apologize. Also for video, don't forget um, accurate and synchronous closed captions, which is um, your, your best practice for video. And I do believe the session on Thursday will talk about it as well, how to do that and how to do that cheaply on, on top of everything. All right, so uh, before we go to the exact preparation tips, I would like to check, uh, check on, your, uh, on your chat and see if there is anything that I missed. Give me just one second. Do you suggest I stop and start the recording multiple times? Uh, flex, my lectures are too. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. So your lecture is too long and I'm talking to Sophia G in Tompkins, Portland. So, um, what I would suggest is just go as you would go, record the whole thing, and then in the post-production, try to cut it. Because even if you try to cut it as you are recording, there might be still some things that you would want to, you want, want to delete out. So I would just go ahead, record the whole thing, and then just make pieces out of it after, after you're through. And actually, um, a funny story, an instructor recited her entire social security number in a, in a live session, recorded session, so she had to go in and she had to very quickly teach herself how to edit video so that she's able to cut the social security number out. So it was, um, that was funny, but yeah, I do, do, do recommend that. And I think I answered Mary's question. Table of contents. Um, okay, somebody's talking about table of contents, right? There you go. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to, to make um, make your video more engaging when, when you have table of contents so that a student can jump to, to the concept uh, that they're looking for to learn more about. And at puzzle question, make it a way for students to jump around and review. Mm -hmm. that, might be a, that might be a good interactive strategy. I would like to see the accessibility of it, how accessible that is, because I'm not familiar, but uh, it sounds like something that would be enjoyed by, by students. Okay. Embedded quiz question in my videos and students, so they seem to like it. Okay, so with this, um, I know technology has progressed, but when, when the embedded quiz questions, and I'm talking about the, the comment from David, uh, that he embedded quiz questions in his videos and students very surprisingly seem to like it. Yes, um, that is definitely something that can boost engaged student engagement. However, it has to be done accessibly. I know many platforms are not able to provide accessibility of it. Um, I know Coursera started doing that and they had huge back, back, back what? backlash. They had a huge backlash because it was not accessible. So students who are not able to click the mouse, they were not able to navigate. So you have to be careful about the platform. But I do know that some platforms are already on the level where accessibility of it is not a problem. But you have to just be mindful of that. And um, use audio to give quick feedback to the students. Paul I saying, I love that. And I actually, to this day, remember, uh, I got audio feedback from one of my instructors. I graduated in 2000, graduated 2012, and I still remember what she said in that, in that recorded uh, feedback because it was so unusual and so personal that I do remember until today um, what she said. All right, anything? 
Polas is uh, concerned about embedding code words in the lecture itself. I think uh, she thinks uh, quiz questions or stop and do activities are okay, but I'm not sure how I would feel about code words integrated to the lecture. You can try if if it works for you, it, it will work. If it doesn't, it's you know you can just toss it. That's fine. It's just something I found um, I found helpful in. Um, also, it creates certain bit of bond because it's a, something sneaky, right? It's something that uh, it's between the, the student and the instructor. So uh, that, that can create also the connection as well. Multiple modes to provide the course content. Pamela, can you, can you please explain what you mean? Um, accessibility, that's part of her concern and she feels it's punitive, especially if we provide multiple modes to provide the course content. I'm trying to understand what you are saying. If you want to grab the mic, that would be great as well. Sure, absolutely. So with that like code word, um, I, I just feel like it, it, it can be a punitive practice. Um, if, we, if we provide multiple modes for a student to engage with the content, um, say they read an article or they visit a industry um, educational site to learn um, the topic or the objectives for that week or that lesson or however the course is organized and they get the content to not know the code word, especially if it's not something that's course related, um, it can be punitive for the student because that, the point is to get the um, learning objectives and the skills that go along um, with the course and and when we think about universal design, if we're if we are trying to really give multiple means of access, um, embedding a code word, or um, I've seen um, instructors um, ask certain, ask the weekly questions in the in the lecture, um, and that's another one where I where I think about the well, one accessibility, and then two, if we embrace um, universal design. Um, that might not be, um, for a variety of reasons, the mode that the student accesses the course content, if that makes sense. It does make sense, and I do agree with you, uh, and also I don't agree with you at the same time. Yes, for if you're providing a video as an additional mode, and they have majority of the content already explained in, in other way, then I would definitely not use the code. However, the, the videos that I used code for was on rubric. I, I noticed that in my previous semester, students have problem understanding the rubric. So I recorded the video on how the rubric is being used and please pay attention to all the criteria in the rubric. And that was one thing that was extremely important to me for students to understand because it will affect their grade. So I did want them to watch the video and um, my video of course had closed captions. So the accessibility was not an issue. They were still able to get the code whether they were listening or whether they were reading. But it was important for me to know that the students saw the video because I know going forward that rubric will be used to, to grade their, their assignments. So I wanted for their own sake, I wanted to, for them to view the video. So that's why um, you probably will have to think about how important the video is to the, to, to the course. If you're explaining instructions and video and the caption is the only way you're explaining the instructions, then you would hope that the students would watch the video, right? So there are videos that are in addition to something and there are videos that are required for, for the successful run of the course. And in those videos, I would not hesitate to, to use any, any kind of questions or codes or whatever you want to call them. But outside of that, I do agree with you. Yes, if it's just a supplemental video, or not just, if it's a supplemental video to content that you already are explaining in certain other way, and the students are not required to watch the video, I would definitely not use that code. So yes, I do agree with you, but I know that in my, in my teaching, there are, some, there are some instances where I definitely think the video watching is an important part of, um, of being su successful in the course. So that's, um, that's, my, that's my distinction. Do we have any other questions that we need to, that we need to talk about? Okay, you can of course um, just put the questions in, in the chat and uh, I will monitor the chat. And for now, I will give the microphone to Jason and uh, he will take it from here. And I will 
stop sharing so that you can start sharing, Jason. Thank you, Taka. <clears throat> Excuse me, everybody. All right, you should be good to go. Okay. Should I click multiple participants or one participant? I am unsure. I think if you just click on the share screen and the PDF that you that you have should appear as one of the options. Or if you want me to, I can share the screen from here and I can just move your slides. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a little issue with that right now. So I appreciate that. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, so before I, I, I get into what I prepared uh, to talk about today, I want to just backtrack quickly to what Tonka talked about, about the length. Um, part of my job responsibilities at SUNY Oswego is to shoot course introductions with faculty for their online courses. And I also shoot instructor bios with them for their courses. So in a traditional setting, we would find a location on campus uh, and shoot face-to-face -face. Uh, the past 18 months or so, um, I've been shooting that over Zoom. And part of the process is to shoot, shoot faculty an initial email, uh, giving them a synopsis, a few questions I'm gonna ask them for their bio, a few set questions that uh, I will ask them for their course introduction. So they kind of have an idea of what they need to talk about. And in that email, I talk about keep your answers concise, keep your answers short. Uh, try to keep it three to five minutes, which is what exactly Tonka talked about. Because it's very difficult for me as an editor, if somebody talks for 15 minutes, to cut, to edit. I am the, also, I'm the editor as well, to cut it down to five or six minutes. Um, six is really pushing it. Um, knock on wood, I've never had an instance where a faculty member has come to me and said, you know, Jason, I really wanted this included in the video. It ended up on the cutting room floor. I've never had a complaint, but it just makes it hard. So if you keep your, your answers short, concise, and clear, it helps the student. And if you ever work with somebody uh, in my role on your campus, it helps them as well. So uh, a few things we're going to talk about. We'll start with lighting, but in general, um, today I'm going to talk about some lighting tips for faculty when they're recording their own videos, um, how to frame their videos properly, uh, what kind of audio is needed or what kind of audio is recommended for their videos and their wardrobe. Um, you know, being on Zoom, we kind of, you know, we, you want your videos looking as professionally as possible. Uh, you treat your videos that you record yourself as if you were going to class and presenting in front of your students like you do every day. First step in, in uh, lighting is to avoid windows behind you. Uh, this gentleman is extremely dark. You can barely see his face. That's because two things, the light is screaming from behind him in the windows, but also he has the screen down, uh, which doesn't even give him any uh, uh, depth of field on his shoulder. So he's limiting himself. And in fact, today, uh, when I popped on my camera, my shade was too high and it was just um, flooding light into myself. So I had to turn my camera off, adjust the shade to a level where I thought it was gonna be comfortable and I'm not too dark. Um, I'm not blown out with a ton of light smashing on my face. Um, so adjust your shade as well and, and try to use uh, the natural light or a window whether it be in your home or an office to your advantage. Exactly what I said, this gentleman, whoops, could we go back? Thanks, Tonka. Uh, the natural light, this gentleman has flipped himself around. You can tell he's using, uh, excuse me, <coughs> he's using a window from his right to, uh, to naturally light himself. In, in the television industry, this is what is called a key light. It's the main primary source of light for faculty or for, for this gentleman. Um, he has also a nice uh, background of a color. 
it makes himself stand out. It makes him jump out from the background. Uh, if you can find a color wall in your home as opposed to a drab white wall or something with uh, some artwork behind yourself or so, some decoration on a shelf, things of that nature, it really helps you jump out. All right, this gentleman is using his, he's using his computer as his primary source of light. And the problem is, is that the computer is giving off a different light temperature than the room lights behind him. This computer that I'm sitting in front of today, it gives off a light of 5,600 degrees Kelvin, which is what the sun gives off if you were in, out, in an outdoor setting. Whereas the, the lights in the room gives off a Kelvin temperature of 3200 degrees Kelvin. So those constant light sources are fighting against each other. The computer uh, lighting source is overpowering the artificial light in the room. And that's why this gentleman looks blue. You do not want to look like a Smurf, you want to look normal. You want to look presentable. So I would not recommend using uh, your computer as your light source for any videos that you're going to produce. Instead, use, if you can't use a window, use lights, uh, you know, table lights, bring them over to yourself, move them from a different location in your living room or in your bedroom or, or if you're in a hotel room. This gentleman is using the lights to his advantage. Um, he's, he's using that, he has a key light and he also has a fill light um, to kind of fill in the other spaces on the left side of his face. So he's doing an excellent job, <coughs> excuse me, I have a dry throat today, uh, of uh, using the lights to his advantage that he has available for him in his room. The height of your camera and framing is something that may get overlooked, but it's also just as important. Try not to have your camera uh, below your face. Try to keep it even with your face. Um, nobody likes to be talked down to. It's very important that we kind of remain on an eye level with one another, whether it's on Zoom or even when you're in person, if you were to talk to somebody in your office. Um, you know, th this gentleman is giving us the up the nose shot. It, it's not a very appealing shot. You know, he's, he's got his, his neck showing and you, you're literally looking up this person's nose. It's just not a very good angle. I'm going to use the same slide, but for a different aspect, this gentleman has raised the height of his camera on his laptop. He's used his camera case. He's maybe grabbed a towel from the bathroom and raised it up, you know, nearly a foot to raise his camera to eye level. So he's speaking on the same level as the students or whoever he is talking to. When you set up your, your camera in your home or, or in your office, um, try to have your eye level being at about three quarters into the frame. As you can see, mine is right about three quarters. I have a little bit of headroom and I have, you know, a good amount of body room. It, my, it's considered the medium shot. You don't want to be too far away where this woman's eye level is almost at 50%. There's way too much headroom up above this lady. Uh, it just doesn't look appealing showing a lot of door. Uh, it's perfect right here in the middle. Just the right amount of head framing, uh, head space. Her eye level is at 75% on the screen. She's wearing a nice vibrant color clothing uh, shirt and we'll get into that in a minute. But on the right here, the, the, the camera is just too close to her face. You know, Her eye level is almost at 50%, which is, I would frown upon. And you can literally see the pores in this woman's skin. She is that close to you. You know, we're all about, well, right now we're all about six, six feet, social distancing, you know, Back in the day when it was not uh, a COVID times, you know, personal space, 
you're literally invading personal space by getting so far up to the camera. You know, just take a step back, give us a nice medium shot. And that's what I would do for any video that you would produce going forward. Uh, for audio purposes, use a headset if possible. Uh, this is a little more direct. It picks up um, your audio very clearly uh, as opposed to uh, the, the ambient room noise that a webcam would produce or uh, a, a built-in uh, microphone on your laptop or on your desktop. This will provide crisp, clear audio uh, for students to hear what you're talking about. And also, it'll improve the accuracy of your captioning as well, which sometimes gets forgotten. Um, you know, as an editor, I appreciate working with faculty over the past 18 months where they wear uh, a headset because it improves the accuracy. It just helps me in post-production uh, when it comes to editing those captions. Um, at SUNY as we go, just captioning something and uploading it and that's it. it. It's not good enough and I'm sure it's the same way everybody else. Uh, I try as when you're working with me, I try to improve those accuracy levels of captioning up to nearly 100%. So I'll go back, I'll change capitalizations, punctuations, run on sentences. Uh, if there's any terminology that gets confusing in the captioning process, I'll contact faculty. I'll be like, you know, can you explain what you're talking to me about here? Let's get the correct term for captioning purposes. So it's very important captioning. This will improve the quality of your captioning. I cannot stress that enough. Wardrobe, dress as if you were teaching face-to-face. -face. Be professional. You know, this lady kind of walked out and she has her bathrobe on. You know, I would not recommend that. <laughs> uh, wear an outfit that you're going to be, which if you were teaching face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, and even if we want, when we go back to face-to-face -face and you record some videos over the weekend or in your spare time for your course, dress professional, wear something um, that's not a pattern because the, the camera will, uh, will pick up on that. It'll be kind of uh, jumbled a little bit, wear a nice, solid, bold color. Did she do that here? Yes. Is she unprofessionally dressed? Yes. So I would stay away from just strolling out in a, a ratty t-shirt or a bathrobe and producing some video content for your course. White clothing is, is a, a nice way uh, to present. Um, not only is this a gentleman using a key light uh, from a room light, he's also um, wearing a white shirt. So you're getting some reflection off that shirt to kind of bounce and fill in some of the uh, imperfections that the one light is, is kind of leaving out. Could this gentleman use another light on the right side of his face? Yes, he probably could. Uh, I'm not sure if it would be available to him or not, but at least by wearing a white shirt, it's reflecting up and balancing uh, the light level of his face and giving him more uh, a natural light look. A few additional tips. Uh, if you're using a script, practice, practice, practice. Just like any presentation, give yourself some time, uh, be prepared. Um, and if you're dissatisfied, do it again. I mean, everybody's video standards are very high. Um, it only takes another couple minutes. If you stumble, um, maybe take it back to that point, start again. If you have the capability of editing the little stumble out, I would recommend it. But um, be prepared and practice, practice, practice. Here's a couple uh, video tips, uh, uh, video software, iMovie, Movie Maker, um, and avoid jump cuts if possible. Um, if you are editing your own content and you edit out a stumble, um, a jump cut is where, you know, it's the same video shot. There's no cutaway of a different shot. So you're, 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 you make the edit and then all of a sudden you're here and you're talking. It, you know, use a dissolve, use a transition, use a wipe, um, use a white flash, things of that nature. 
Uh, so it's not as jarring to the student when they're watching your video. And that's all the uh, content I have today. Um, <laughs> what I would this, like to ask. Mullet. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just looking at the uh, some of the comments in chat. Cover it with a graphic is is also acceptable. Yes, if you have graphics available, um, especially in some of the uh, uh, instructor bios that I do. Um, you know, I'll bring up some imagery, uh, a graphic that I will, uh, I will take my, I'll cover my jump cut with. I usually uh, have a moving background with some imagery of whatever university that they attended, or maybe a course topic or things of that nature. I'm glad you brought that up. That's an excellent point, Adele. Thank you. Uh, the Pamela, um, the video system that I use is Premiere Pro. Uh, we have the whole Adobe Premiere. Um, sweet i don't use it all I, I just don't have the need for it but we uh we have i have adobe premiere 2020 on my desktop right now uh, i don't use a laptop i have a desktop with two large monitors because just the setup of premiere pro is easier for me um to look at larger screens as opposed to small so uh but i highly re recommend premiere pro it's fairly simple to use you can pretty much hit the ground running on it. B-roll of your college, office, library, et cetera. Yes, uh, in my spare time, I have gone around campus um, to shoot campus shots as soon as we go, um, as well as uh, students as well. Um, I will uh, coordinate it with faculty um, to be able to go into their um, classroom. And it's always cleared with the students before I walk in. That way I don't surprise them and I get weird looks. Uh, but especially in instructor bio, when they're talking about you know, how long they've taught at SUNY Oswego, um, I'll have that video um, at my disposal, showing them interacting with students, uh, showing them teaching and lecturing them in person. And to me as an editor, it just brings their video to a whole new level. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, uh, Susan um, from New Pulse. Yes, it, um, it's nice that we do provide professional video services. Uh, I do not record lectures. Uh, that would just, it would take too, up too much of my time. But um, just doing course introductions and instructor bios kind of keeps me busy enough because I'm working with people all over campus. We offer so many online courses that it, it definitely keeps me busy. So, and I have si little side projects on the side through extended learning that uh, highlight some of the programs that we offer. So um, that kind of fills in any, any slow times that I might have throughout the year. Yeah, Zoom, uh, Adele, Zoom, Zoom is great. It's been a lifesaver over these past 15 months for all of us. Uh, I think we've learned to adapt to the Zoom life quickly. I don't, I don't personally think that Zoom will be uh, going away. Um, I, I still think we'll do Zooms for occasional meetings. Um, we were just talking about that in our uh, quarterly staff meeting the other day. Um, but you know, it'll take some time to get back to the way things were. But I think I always think that it, Zoom it's going to be a it's going to be a part of our lives. And faculty were quick to adjust to it and and learn uh, how it works. And it only took them two month, two weeks, three weeks maybe to kind of transition to using Zoom. And uh, then it took two or three weeks um, to start their projects with me. So there wasn't much of a drop off when the pandemic started, which was really nice. Camtasia, uh, I, Paula, I don't have a whole lot of experience in Camtasia. It, it's, um, we're, we're um, we use Panopto a lot, faculty uses, uh, but uh, I know there are some that uh, use Camtasia. I believe that there was more faculty that used Camtasia about five years ago when I started on campus. Um, 
but I feel like people are transitioning to Panopto a little bit more. Uh, I'm sorry, I really uh, can't answer your question all that much, but. But if you're comfortable using Camtation, it works for you. Absolutely, that, that, that's totally fine. So that's um, that's pretty much all I have, Tonka, right now. Thanks. Does anybody have any questions for Tonka or Jason, just kind of in general about um, best practices for, you know, the approach to creating videos, etc. As we are waiting for questions, I would like to know if anybody got inspired to create a video of uh, of their own and what it's going to be about so if you can uh, either grab microphone and say or just share it in chat or maybe you got inspired to edit some of your existing videos to maybe be more engaging for your students should anything that you're taking away from this from this workshop today There was one comment I see about integrating Panopto into Blackboard. Uh, yes, that's part of the process that I do with faculty. I will upload, uh, when I'm done editing the captions, I'll upload it to Panopto and I'll share it with faculty uh, directly into their course, just to make it as easy on them as possible. Um, and if they have any issues with it, uh, they can certainly work with me to resolve any issues or they can uh, you know, make a couple cuts and take out whatever they need to do. Uh, but it's a, it's a really nice, um, compatibility with Blackboard that you can, you're able to do that. So yes. There was a question from Michelle and Benjamin, maybe that you guys can address. All right, it just moved from under me. One second. Michelle, can you please ask in um, using the microphone? Uh, the question from Benjamin is, which video recording tools produce videos that can be adapted so we don't need to re-record with a different tool? Example, if I record a Zoom, will, will that be portable? As far as I, I oh, 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 sorry. Go ahead, Jason. No, 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 you go ahead, please. <laughs> as far as I know, you have different outputs from different tools and um, those are transferable between, between systems. So like, for example, we, uh, we use Panopto as well as um, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and both are able to give you MP, MP4s. So, um, and those are just universal video formats that you are able to take down into your editing software and just edit away. But uh, I would like to hear from Jason since he's the expert. I'm just, um, I'm just a wannabe. <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know, not being a faculty member, I'm not, I, I'm not hundred percent sure. I mean, I record on zoom as well. And, you know, I just get a file. So I, I, I think that, you can always have that on your computer and move it to wherever you need and you wouldn't need to re-record. Yeah, it's an MP4, so you can move it into pretty much- Exactly. To play around with. Mm -hmm. There was an important com a comment from uh, Robin Sullivan about how to break up large videos. And she included a link there. I think that's a good one. How to add start and stop times in the link URL so that Robin, does that take them directly to that point in the video? Yes, and um, I just learned earlier about the chapter feature in um, YouTube, so I'm going to have to explore to see how different they are. But one thing that I really like, I think uh, Tonka had mentioned, sometimes some people get put off when they can't watch the full video. You know, mm -hmm. you're watching, watching, and then it stops and says, okay, answer this question before you can proceed. Um, if you provide the short um, the links with the start and stop, you can also provide the same, you know, the link that goes all the way through. So people have the option to watch it in chunks and also possibly review in chunks. Um, so this way, if you're, you know, kind of have this long video, but then you can say the part about this concept is between one minute and two minutes, you can go back and review. 
And I like that option. Um, I think it was Robert Becker earlier who mentioned the chapters. Do you want to talk maybe about how you use those, Robert? Oh, I've just started experimenting with them because what I found is I'm used to with the history lectures giving these long overarching storylines and I don't want the students to lose the arc. And I found that by doing shorter by shorter videos, they would have a problem making the connection between video one and video five. So I found that if I did my full lecture and then I you can tag the time at certain points and then the students can hover and see what is the topic covered at a certain point. So it's like five videos, but I don't have to stop and compose five videos. I run my lecture, and since I'm following a standard outline form, then at the end I just like, and now we are transitioning to the War of the Roses, or now we are coming out of the War of the Roses. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, Any Robert, other? thank you for sharing. That is a great idea. Any other questions? Susan is saying about the resolution. When you are trying to splice two different videos with different screen resolutions, that might give you some extra editing time there. That's a good point. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. Uh, I think we inspired some people. I'm seeing that some of you are going to be recording intro videos. So that is fantastic. Hopefully on your campus, you have a videographer or an instructional designer who is, who is fluent in video and hopefully they'll be able to help you. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for, no such luck. I'm sorry, Paula. <laughs> thank, you for, um, thank you for your time, for your questions. Um, my email is, I'm going to put my email in the chat and Jason, uh, you can as well. I will do that as well, yes. Thank you. And um, you. if you would like to work more with us, uh, collaborate on anything, please let us know. We'll be happy to do it. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you in an hour or so. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Tonka. Uh, Tonka will be back at the one o'clock hour to do another presentation for us. And um, 